Night Search. I'm Eddie Middleton in Memphis, and I'm talking with Laura Knight tonight. And we were talking about uh, her work in exorcism, and we're leading up to um, a discussion of her work on the Matrix. But uh, with just a few more things I want to ask you about the exorcism thing. And you were talking about this woman that the man got the possession from to begin with because he was having uh, sex with her, and that's when the possession took hold of him. Exactly how does that work? Uh, is his soul like more open during that time? I've heard uh, Al Bielik was on our show last week. He said at the point of uh, sexual orgasm that the conscious and subconscious unite, and that would be a time when they could program people like with the Montauk, you know, thing where they, they had the Montauk boys and they did those kind of things. Would that be a, a, a time when one would be more open to be possessed? Well, that's certainly uh, a good comparison because it does seem to be so. Uh, the problem comes in, I think, um, it goes back again to this self-serving agenda. Uh, whenever two people interact with one another, uh, the chief problem seems to be that they are interacting with an individual who has a certain, say, uh, physical appearance. They then project onto this person with this certain physical appearance uh, qualities that they may not possess. Uh, we all are probably pretty familiar with this because right. of our relationships with other people that very often we think somebody is something and then after a period of time we discover that uh, who we thought they were is not who they are. Right. Sometimes it's very uh, very heartbreaking to come to that realization. Yes, yeah, I've been through a few of those scenarios. Yeah, especially if you're married to the person and you have children with them and then you finally have to realize or accept, face the fact that this person is not at all who you thought it was and then either you decide you're going to like them as they are or that you can't live with them as they are. I was thinking of, of Shakespeare in one of his sonnets is talking about his mistress. He said, I swore thee fair and thought thee bright, but thou art as black as hell, as dark as night. <laughs> well, there you have it. So what happens is, is that when two people interact, and if they have, each of them, a false image of the other, they are each interacting in a self-serving way. I mean, I, I'm trying to convey a, a kind of a very subtle concept here. Mm -hmm. So when at the point of orgasm, they are each believing deep in their heart something about the experience and the other per person that is essentially a lie because it has no basis in objective reality. <laughs> Mike could comment that the moment of sexual orgasm, one is, is a, the most vulnerable, you know, in, in a state of, of maximum, for maximum deception, that's it. Right, and if you are in this deep belief in a lie, even if you're believing this lie very innocently, then you attract into you lying forces, and depending upon the depth of the lie and the strength of the lie and the power of the individual soul believing the lie, probably resonates into the universe and attracts into that uh, void a matching frequency. That gives a whole uh, different twist of meaning to the saying lying with somebody. Uh, yeah. It's a euphemistic way of talking of sex about sexual intercourse. Yeah, so I, I, I hope that, that that kind of explains how it works because we're once again we're talking about frequencies, we're talking about energies, we're talking about you know the universe as waveforms of frequency and energy. And when you produce frequencies and energies inside yourself, and those frequencies and energies intensify. Uh, through the electromagnetic activities that go on during uh, sexual intercourse and at the point of orgasm, uh, you are indeed very vulnerable to that which you believe. If you believe a lie, you are vulnerable to a lie. And being possessed by lying forces. Right. Yeah. And that's how he came to be possessed. Right, right. So. Well, what was the final, uh, like, 
how come with his story uh, and with the woman he was associated with, how did it all finally play out? Well, after I nearly killed myself taking care of his situation, I spent, oh, probably four or five hours a day for, you know, ten days afterward counseling with him. Uh, it took me several days before I was even able to play the tape to him to explain to him what had happened to him because, you know, like I said, what do you do when somebody thinks they just have a self-esteem problem? You know, you break it to them gently or as gently as you can that, you know, hey, you had a demon. You know, this was serious. Yeah. And uh, he uh, he was feeling really good and, uh, you know, we, we got him to the point where he was in really good shape. And uh, and then I played the tape for him. He understood what had happened, what had gone on. I explained to him, listen, you have just had major surgery here. Uh, you know, we got you all cleaned out. The cancer's gone. We've got you bandaged up. You're, you're all sewn up. You know, do not play in the dirt. Mm. And he, he, he was good for a few weeks. And then he began having contact with her again, which he really couldn't avoid because they had a child together. Yeah. And the contact with her uh, led to, of course, you know, ultimately uh, being reinfested, and he called me in a panic. And at that point, I did not see any reason, uh, you know, if a person cannot take their medicine, if they can't stay out of the dirt, and I knew at this point in time that, to put it bluntly, those some bitches were up to get me. Yeah. And the next time I worked with this guy, it, you know, they were going to come back with, you know, with reinforcements. They were going to be laying in wait for me. Yeah, I hear that they do bring in heavy reinforcements during some of these exercises. Oh, yeah. So at that point, I told him that I was not going to do another exorcism that there were other ways and means that he would have to work on himself, that if he was uncomfortable enough uh, to be motivated to work on himself, that he would, have to, he would have to do certain work in order to prepare himself to eject this thing more or less by the strength of his own will, which in the ultimate sense, that's where it has to end. It has to end with the person doing the work on themselves to be able to take care of this sort of thing themselves. He, uh, I gave him a whole series of tapes, I gave him books, I gave him a whole, you know, program of things to do, and it was just too much like work. It was easier to go play in the dirt and then go back and have somebody clean him up. Yeah, but what about the woman? Now, did, was she uh, seeking help for her possession, or was she not even really aware of being possessed herself? Well, he brought her to me at one point during the course of this whole in interaction uh, for an interview, and I talked to her, and, and I actually, in order to even schedule an interview with her, I said, I want you to write an essay for me, and I want you to, you know, write into this essay something about your background, something about your thoughts, uh, you know, your feelings about things, and she, she wrote about 20 pages. And I still have that 20 pages, and you have never read 20 pages of more revolting, disgusting rambling in your entire life. And, you know, this girl was in a really, in a really, really bad way, and yet she would sit in front of me and use the foulest language you could possibly imagine, talking about, well, yeah, I went to the bar and I went outside and we, you know, blankety-blanked and blankety-blanked, and yeah, there was five guys, and oh, I loved it, and so on and so forth. And then when I mentioned the idea of spirit attachment or, you know, possession or whatever, well, I, if I have any problems like that, I'll just go down to the church and they'll take care of it for me. Yeah, they did already. <laughs> well, but there was no point in telling her that because when I pointed this out to her, she actually got very angry. And... Once again, you just come face to face with the fact that people suffer what they suffer until they learn how not to. You might say they had made their bed and they had just decided to go ahead and keep on lying. And right, until it got miserable enough for them to do something. About, I mean, it was too easy for them to just come and say, oh, you know, here, take care. I mean, it was like, Mama, pick me up and carry me. Well, guess what? you got to learn to walk. Mm. And uh, people don't like to be told that they've got to learn to walk. Well, let me uh, ask you now about the, the demons where they reside, you say, in the fifth density? 
Uh, this is what we call it. It's, uh, it's a, a completely ethereal state of existence. has no physical um, manifestation. Are they eternal beings? I mean, they've always existed and always will exist? or Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they, they cycle around, I'm sure. I think that when... Uh, when some of these uh, demonic type beings, of course, you know, their their objective is to become one with God in the same sense uh, as those who serve others, you know, seek to become one. But they seek to become one with God by stuffing all of existence inside themselves, by uh, by absorbing all other beings, you know, to self, because they perceive God as as the center of their being. And what happens is, is they gain so much weight, so to speak, that at a certain point, they, uh, uh, how to say, they, they implode on themselves. Night Search. I'm Eddie Middleton in Memphis, and I'm talking with Laura Knight tonight. And we were talking about uh, her work in exorcism, and we're leading a, a, a time when one would be more open to be possessed. Well, that's certainly uh, a good comparison because it does seem to be so. Uh, the problem comes in, I think. Well, sex with her, and that's when the possession took hold of him. Yeah, exactly how does that work? Uh, is his soul like more open during that time? I've heard uh, Al Bielik was on our show last week. He said at the point of uh, sexual orgasm that the conscious and subconscious unite and that would be a time when they could program people, like with the Montauk, you know, thing where they, they had the Montauk boys and they did those kind of things. Would that be up to a um, uh, discussion of her work on the Matrix? But uh, with just a few more things I want to ask you about the exorcism thing. And you were talking about this woman that the man got the possession from to begin with because he was having...